Welcome back to ACT on Mental Health. My name is Sean Hardy, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor here in the state of Indiana. Now, I made this channel as an attempt to help you better understand acceptance and commitment therapy and mental health issues. We're all coming into ACT from different contexts. You may have heard about it uh, from a therapist, self-help book, TED Talk, or graduate school. Or you may have just been browsing on YouTube and found your way here. Now, whether you're a beginner or more advanced in ACT, chances are you're going to come across RFT. And so I thought I'd make a series of videos on relational frame theory to help us better understand what it is and how it connects with ACT. Now, if you haven't heard of it before, you may want to check out my video, uh, Relational Frame Theory for Beginners. Uh, but we're going to be getting into it and really going through some of the details of it. And so if you have a a notepad, a pen, or your note-taking device, I highly recommend you get that uh, because we're going to be covering some terms, and definitions, and a lot of ground uh, over the next couple of videos. The story of RFT starts in an unexpected place, learning how to read. Back in the 1970s, a group of American psychologists led by Murray Sidman were studying how people with learning difficulties were taught to read by making connections. They used a simple method called matching to sample to see how individuals link words like dog with the letters D-O-G to a picture of a dog. Now this method is like a game where you learn to pick one thing you, you see versus another. So imagine someone hears the word dog and has to choose between pictures of a dog, a cat, and a pig. And if they pick the right picture, they get a thumbs up and the game continues. Well, in the early 1980s, Sidman expanded this method to teach kids to pick the right picture in Word when they heard a matching word. So how did this work? Well, after a child learned to point to a picture of a dog, and when they heard the word dog, they would then point to a picture of a word D-O-G when they heard the word dog. And then something interesting happened. The child could now match the picture with the word without being taught directly. Sidman also discovered that children could flip these learned connections and match the picture with the sound and the word with the sound without any extra learning. They did it on their own. Imagine it like this. At first they learned two basic connections, but then four other connections appear by themselves, linking things that didn't seem to relate before. It might sound simple, like something you do naturally, but it caused quite a lot of excitement because existing theories couldn't explain it. The kids had no previous experience connecting different things. And it wasn't just about similarities. There was nothing dog-like about the word dog. So something unique was happening. But what? Sidman showed that these children were treating these three things, the sound, the picture, and the word, as if they were all the same. Think of it like this. If A is like B, then B is like A. And if A is like B, and B is like C, then A is like C, and C is like A. Sidman called this stimulus equivalence, and it opened up a whole new era of research. Further studies confirmed how important Sidman's work was. They found that only humans could easily flip and combine these connections with minimal training. Other animals struggled with this, even with a lot of training. Not even animals that are good with language, like chimpanzees, could do this. This special ability seems to develop when complex language skills start to develop, around 16 to 18 months old. People who lose their ability to speak, like after a stroke, also lose this skill. It turns out this seemingly small ability is at the core of human language. The ability to connect things in our minds is a big deal for humans. And it's something that other animals simply can't do the same way. Imagine it like this. You're about to take your dog to the park for a walk. And so you say, walk? And what does the dog do? It gets all excited in anticipation because it knows when you say the word walk that a walk to the park is coming. But let's say you'd only ever said the word walk after you went to the park, when you got home. So when you said walk before you go to the park, the dog's not going to react the same way because it can't reverse the connections between park and the word walk. It only works one way. Whatever comes before sets up the expectation for what's to come. 
Think about a similar situation with a child who can talk. A parent may give the child candy and then say, sweet. And then another time, the parent may ask the child if they want a sweet, and the child still knows what it means and says, yes, please. This works because a talking child can reverse the candy and the sweet connection. The ability to flip and combine these connections helps humans connect all sorts of different things. And it's at the heart of how we use language. Now let's talk about relational frame theory, RFT. Some psychologists in the 1990s in the United States and Ireland came up with this theory to explain what was going on with these connections. They wanted to understand not just why we can reverse connections, but also why we can make all kinds of connections, like saying something is bigger, smaller, or the same. To get this, you need to understand the idea of relational responding. We all react to what things look like, like picking a shape based on how it looks. But relational responding goes further. It's about picking something based on a relationship between two or more things. Imagine three balls of different sizes. If you're asked which is the biggest and you have the small and medium ones, you'd probably pick the medium sized one. But if you had the medium and large one, you'd pick the large one. It's all about the connection between these things and not just what they look like. This theory says relational responding is like a building block of how we understand things. It's influenced by the situation, like what happens before and after to what motivates us. So when you see those balls, you're not just thinking about balls, you're thinking about the concept of bigger. You're using the frame bigger to respond to the question, which is bigger. RFT also says that humans can learn different types of relational responding. This helps us connect things in many ways based on what's going on around us. For example, we can say two things are the same, like two chairs. We can say two things are different, like a bike and a car. We can say two things are similar, like apples and oranges. We can say two things are opposite, like good and bad. We can compare things, like Ben is faster than Tom. We can talk about time, like tomorrow comes after today. We can look at things from different angles, like I and you, here and there, then and now. All this lets us do things that other animals can't. For instance, if you know that A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, without more training, you'll also know that A is bigger than C and the opposite, C is smaller than A. This is like learning the value of coins. Kids often think bigger coins are worth more or more coins buy more than less coins, but sometimes that's not true. For example, even though a half dollar coin are larger than a dollar coin, they're worth less. But if kids learn that a dollar coin buys more than a half dollar coin, and a half dollar coin buys more than five nickels, they'll choose the dollar coin when asked which is worth more, and the half dollar coin to buy more sweets. They figure this out by combining what they learn about A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, something other animals can't do but children show that they can do this. In everyday life, we often make connections between different things without needing special training. ACT calls this derived relational responding, and this is how it works. Imagine that you're in an Indian restaurant and you wanna know how spicy the curries are. The waiter explains that korma is mild, a buna is hotter than a korma, and that a madras is hotter than a buna, and a vindaloo is hotter than a madras. Even though these curries were never directly compared, you instantly know that a vindaloo is hotter than a korma and a buna. You naturally respond to a relationship between different things without being taught. To see how you naturally relate things, consider these questions about cats and dogs. How are cats and dogs different? How are cats and dogs similar? How are cats and dogs opposite? How is a cat better than a dog? How is a dog nicer than a cat? Did you notice how questions made you think about different aspects of cats and dogs? This happens because the questions give you cues for specific types of relationships between them. It's automatic 
and happens all the time. Here's another exercise. Write down two different things. So you're going to write first noun, and you're also going to write a second noun. Are you done? All right, a little bit more time? All right, good. Now ask yourself, how are these things different? How are these things alike? What is better about the second thing? How is the first thing smaller than the second? These exercises show you how you can relate anything to anything else based on cues that you get. This is a big part of how human language works, giving you a flexible and creative way to understand the world around you. To review, in this video, we learned about RFT's origins, some of the research behind RFT, and some of the terms RFT uses. In the next video, we'll continue learning about RFT and how it connects with ACT and how we can practically apply it to improve our mental health.